Professor Porter mentioned to me uh, that he liked short introductions. Uh, you all were able to pick up a program. I'm going to take time to read from that uh, introduction on the program for a minute, in spite of the fact that it will lengthen the introduction because it's a remarkable record, and I want to make sure that sets the stage for us for this, uh, this evening's lecture. Professor Robert Roger B. Porter is IBM Professor of Business and Government and joined the Kennedy School faculty at Harvard in 1977. He served for more than a decade in senior economic policy positions in the White House, most recently as assistant to the President for Economic and Domestic Policy from 1989 to 1993. He served as director of the White House Office of Policy Development in the Reagan administration and as executive secretary of the President's Economic Policy Board during the Ford administration. We were talking before, uh, just after he arrived in town today, and I, we thought it was interesting to note that we don't know anyone else, any other living American, who has had presidential appointments from each of the last eight United States presidents. Uh, but that is uh, a distinction uh, that, uh, own, that is owned by Professor Porter. Uh, his, pu his publications include Presidential Decision Making and Efficiency, Equity, and Legitimacy, the Multilateral Trading System at the Millennium. He is an alumnus of Brigham Young University. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University where he received the B.Phil was a White House Fellow and received MA and PhD degrees from Harvard University. It's also worthy of note that uh, beginning in 1987, Professor Porter has taught uh, a class at Harvard, the class at Harvard, on the American presidency. And uh, a rough estimate tells us that at least thousands of students uh, have passed through that experience and have had uh, the opportunity to take that course from Professor Porter over the years. We are honored and uh, very pleased that he would be with us this evening. His topic of it this evening is what great leaders do, and it is now my pleasure to turn the time to Professor Roger B. Porter. Well, thank you, uh, Richard, for that generous introduction. It's a delight for me to be back on this campus to sense the enthusiasm and commitment to learning that pervades its buildings and characterizes its grounds. I'm grateful for the uh, invitation from the Wheatley Institution and the leadership of that great body including President Merrill Bateman, who uh, was the advisor for my senior honors thesis when he was a young professor and I was an even younger student here many years ago. Uh, I am particularly grateful for the privilege of sharing this occasion with my father, who is now nearing his 90th birthday and to acknowledge his decades of service as a teacher and administrator on this campus. His commitment to Brigham Young University remains an important part of his life. Many of the characteristics of great leaders that I will discuss this evening are ones that I first saw exhibited by him in our home. And I'm also grateful to be accompanied by our daughter Rachel, a student here at BYU, who has demonstrated in her life the kind of excellence that BYU seeks to encourage and cultivate in all of its students. The characteristics of great leaders is a fascinating subject. Surveys are taken and scholarly papers are written to examine the topic. The reputations of leaders rise and fall as we gain further perspective and learn more about the internal deliberations by which 
decisions were reached and why. How we evaluate presidential greatness is a subject to which I devote an entire lecture in the course I teach on the American presidency. It's a question that yields differing assessments and much debate. My purpose this evening, however, is to explore in the time that we have available a somewhat different issue, what it is that great leaders do. The reason for my emphasis is that I want to invite you to think about leadership in a broader context, for there are opportunities and responsibility for leadership in all types of organizations, familial and societal, corporate and governmental, secular and ecclesiastic. The examples that I will use come from the experience of national political leaders, largely from the United States, but the characteristics that I will outline are applicable whether one is leading a family, a business, a government, a university, or an ecclesiastical organization. We look to leaders to make decisions, solve problems, provide direction, organize and inspire the activities of others, and much more. The list of potential tasks of a leader is long. So what is it that differentiates those leaders whom we consider great? The book of Proverbs contains a short, powerful, and oft-repeated thought. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Great leaders have a vision that guides their decisions. Let me explain by distinguishing two possible approaches to leading an organization or a people. The first approach focuses on solving problems. The problem-solving leader identifies the most important problems at any given time, seeks to understand them, and to address them. And as leaders discover, there is no shortage of problems that need to be solved. As soon as one is addressed, another requires our attention. Problem-solving leaders gain great skill in diagnosing a problem, identifying a viable range of options for addressing it, and choosing from among those options the path that is likely to have the best ratio of advantages to disadvantages. The goal is to make an informed decision. At its essence, this problem-solving approach is reactive. It seeks to respond quickly and effectively to the circumstances of the time. Some leaders succeed in putting in place early warning systems to help identify problems quickly. They are good at fixing things that go wrong and at turning around organizations that are experiencing problems. A second approach to leading an organization begins by the leader establishing a limited number of overarching goals and objectives. These goals serve as the prism through which every problem or challenge is viewed. What drives the decision-making process is the question, in deciding this issue, what path will take us furthest in the direction of achieving our overarching goal? Such decisions constitute a strategy in which the focus of attention is not on solving problems, but on achieving a major goal. The distinction is a subtle but important one. It causes leaders to view the decisions they make as part of a tapestry which they are determinedly weaving. Great leaders, of course, must be wise in their selection of goals, for once goals are selected, they become a driving vision. This approach to leadership is decidedly proactive rather than reactive. It is not, however, oblivious to current circumstances. It recognizes that Problems are usually best addressed early and in a systematic and informed way. The difference is that great leaders are searching the horizon 
not for problems that need solutions, but for the surest and most efficient path to the overarching goal or goals they have established. It is a style of leadership that is both patient and determined. The view it seeks is longer and animated by a specific goal or goal rather than simply doing the right thing to address the problems with which one is faced. The temptation is strong, especially for talented and ambitious people, to try to do more and more, to redouble one's efforts in the face of a challenge, to try to work harder, longer, and smarter. It is a condition of life that there are more useful activities than there are hours in the day or available resources to address them. A central question of life and of leadership is the necessity of choice. A primary task of leadership consists in determining the hierarchy of an organization's interests and how best to advance them. Great leaders have an ability to focus not merely their attention, but also the attention of those whom they lead on a limited number of goals and objectives. They are not diverted by the seemingly urgent. That advice is easy to articulate and to understand, but it's difficult to follow. Thomas Jefferson, one of our most intellectually brilliant presidents, had a wide range of interests. At a White House dinner honoring Nobel Prize winners, John F. Kennedy observed that it was the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge, that has ever been gathered together in the White House with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. He added, someone once said that Thomas Jefferson was a gentleman of 32 who could calculate an eclipse, survey an estate, tie an artery, plan an edifice, try a cause, break a horse, and dance the minuet. At the same time, Jefferson recognized that great leaders do not allow themselves the luxury of dissipating their time, energy, or capital. In his view, great organizations focus their attention on large questions. In a letter to er Edward Carrington in 1787, he wrote, I have ever viewed the executive details as the great cause of evil to us because they in fact place us as if we had no federal head by diverting the attention of that head from great to small objects. Two examples will illustrate the point. During the course of political campaigns, candidates are expected to articulate their views on a wide variety of issues. These views are sometimes made in the form of promises, pledges, and commitments. Once in office, the pressure to fulfill these promises is intense, especially from those who provided support and have developed a set of expectations. As campaigns have lengthened and recording devices capture and can retrieve virtually everything that a candidate utters, this phenomenon has become more acute. When Jimmy Carter came into office in January of 1977, he was determined to fulfill his campaign promises, and he had them compiled into a large binder. A copy was provided to members of his cabinet with instructions that these promises should guide their decision making. And in the first months of his administration, much work was done to advance proposals that would help to fulfill these promises. In retrospect, President Carter acknowledged in his memoir, Keeping Faith, that he had overloaded the agenda, that he was involved in too many things simultaneously. By not determining his priorities and pursuing those relentlessly, he had implicitly ceded leadership to the Congress. The initiative once lost was difficult to regain. 
He recorded in his diary, eight days after taking office, everyone has warned me not to take on too many projects so early in the administration, but it's almost impossible for me to delay something that I see needs to be done. His successor, Ronald Reagan, entered office with a limited number of specific overarching objectives. His approach and the discipline that accompanied it had two striking effects within his administration. The first was that it reduced the inevitable discussions and debates within any administration regarding priorities. Given that the priorities were clear in the president's mind, the attention could focus on the most successful ways of implementing those priorities. The president's priorities were so consistent and his policy preferences so clear that they constituted highly useful guidance to administration officials. A second effect of having a limited number of clear priorities was the useful signal that it sent to others, in this case, the Congress, the public, organized interests, and the press. Others could challenge or contest his priorities, but there was no uncertainty regarding what those priorities were. This did not mean that there were not spirited debates within his administration over the best way to achieve his goals. And moreover, changing circumstances did prompt discussion from time to time about whether to modify or amend those goals. But the limited goals provided a powerful focus to the administration's activities. Ronald Reagan was clear in his mind about his goals domestically and internationally and he successfully communicated those goals and priorities to others. Great leaders concentrate on the important and as Chu, the less important. A related characteristic of great leaders is the importance they attach to long-term and short-term considerations. How to weigh long-term long considerations is a particular challenge in a democratic political system where elected officials must always keep their eyes alert and ears attuned to public sentiment. Democracy and representative government are consistent with individuals making choices in their lives and accepting responsibility for helping to shape the institutions by which they are governed. Winston Churchill famously remarked in a speech in the House of Commons that democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Democracy, however, has two persistent challenges. Because democracy involves periodic elections, elected officials must achieve support at regular intervals from the electorate. The phrase, what have you done for me lately, is often on the minds of many voters. As a result, democracies tend to battle two challenges. The first is finding an appropriate balance between current consumption and future investment. And the second is finding an appropriate balance between our desire for security and stability and our recognition of the need for dynamism, change, and innovation. Great individuals, great organizations, great societies are not preoccupied with current consumption but are prepared to defer gratification and invest in the future. Likewise, they recognize the value of dynamism, change, and innovation, and do not allow themselves to be overtaken by a preoccupation with security and stability. Most presidents feel like they have been dealt a difficult hand when they come into office. Consider the situation of Gerald Ford when he replaced Richard Nixon, who resigned in August of 1974. The country had suffered through arguably the worst political scandal in its history. Public trust in government had plummeted. The nation was mired in a highly unpopular war halfway around the globe in Vietnam. The previous year, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, had imposed a six-month embargo on all oil shipments to the United States, prompting the administration to launch 
project independence to free ourselves from uncertain foreign sources of oil. During the three months before Gerald Ford took office, the wholesale price index, which we now call the producer price index, was increasing at an annual rate of 37 percent, the most explosive outburst of inflation in United States history. At the same time that inflation was rising at high double-digit levels, the unemployment rate had started to rise. Previous economic thinking had embraced the so-called Phillips curve, which postulated an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. And now the economy was characterized by both rising inflation and rising unemployment, what economists soon began calling stagflation. Soon after taking office, Gerald Ford established two goals, both long-term in nature, that would guide his decisions. The first was to heal the nation from the mistrust that the combination of Vietnam and Watergate had produced. And the second was to put the economy on a sound long-term footing and to place it on a path of sustained economic growth without inflation. Both goals were long-term and required taking measures that entailed decisions that were unpopular in the short term. To turn the page for a brighter future often requires courage as well as vision. Ten days into office, he addressed the annual convention of the veterans of foreign wars and courageously announced an amnesty program for the more than 50,000 Vietnam War draft evaders. Characteristically, the program he called for was earned amnesty that gave young Americans in whom he had so much confidence a second chance. Three weeks later, he stunned the nation by issuing a full and unconditional pardon to Richard Nixon for any offenses that he had committed during his years in the Oval Office. Ford could foresee that without such a pardon, the indictment, prosecution, trial, probable conviction, and lengthy appeals process would consume the nation's attention and energy for the next three to five years. He realized that his action would offend many Americans' sense of justice. He recognized the personal political damage that he would suffer. But political expediency was never his guide, and many who once opposed his decision to pardon Nixon have come to recognize its wisdom. Secondly, his stewardship of the economy involved two defining principles, fiscal responsibility and a steadfast embrace of market mechanisms as the best way to allocate resources. He declared in his first State of the Union address that he would propose no new spending programs until the federal budget was balanced. In his desire to establish fiscal discipline, he vetoed 66 bills, and despite large opposition majorities in Congress, only 12 of those vetoes were overridden. He launched a regulatory reform movement in transportation and energy that each succeeding administration embraced and enlarged helping to transform the U.S. economy into the envy of the world. At a time when protectionist pressures were intense, he successfully pursued trade liberalization. The unifying theme of his economic policies was attention to the long-term interests of the nation and a willingness to accept short-term adjustments, however painful. Great leaders build a foundation of support that sustains the policies that they put in place. The effectiveness of any policy depends in part on the foundation of support on which it rests. Two elements in particular are essential. The first is the breadth of support that the policy enjoys. Whatever is put in place can be challenged and sometimes reversed. In a system like the U.S. government, there are many avenues to seek to overturn a policy one opposes, legislatively, judicially, administratively. A second element is the understanding 
of and the commitment to the policy by those who will implement it. Every policy involves a host of implementing decisions. Those who articulate and formulate a policy depend on the cooperation of those who will make those implementing decisions. Almost immediately after taking office, Gerald Ford convened a bipartisan summit conference on inflation. He solicited suggestions from those representing all sectors of the economy and the bipartisan leadership in Congress. Among the sessions that I remember best was one involving a group of 30 leading economists, 15 Republican, 15 Democrat, many of whom had served as advisors in Republican and Democratic administrations. When the President joined the meeting, he invited Arthur Oaken the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Lyndon Johnson, to summarize the discussion. Oaken's summary was clear and accurately represented the views of those in attendance. He observed that the assembled economists differed on many policies and priorities, but there was one thing on which they all agreed. The pattern of economic regulation then in place was unnecessarily contributing to the rising inflation. And that consensus proved to be the catalytic event that led to the pattern of economic deregulation that followed. Airlines, trucking, railroads, oil and natural gas, telecommunications, and financial services under Republican and Democratic administrations over the next three decades. George H.W. Bush entered office facing larger opposition majorities than any elected president in United States history. He determined to advance a comprehensive proposal to break a 13-year deadlock in the Congress over a new Clean Air Act. The saga of its passage is instructive. Its ambitious goals were achieved by a new means, an innovative, market-oriented emissions trading system to replace the traditional command and control regulation. The combination represented a solid foundation that ultimately garnered the support of environmentalists and business leaders. His patience and balanced approach yielded large bipartisan majorities in the House of Representatives, where the measure passed 401 to 21, and in the Senate, where the measure passed 89 to 11. Can you imagine today any major comprehensive proposal passing with those kinds of majorities. And moreover, by involving those in his administration who would implement the bill, the regulations drafted to bring the provisions into effect were faithful to the original intent of the legislation. Great leaders also teach reality. We live in a time when people want to be soothed and comforted, reassured that all will be well, that the few rather than the many will make whatever adjustments are needed. Sweeping claims and goals are announced with little detail regarding the specific measures required to reach them. The assumptions that are used in making many projections tend to be overly optimistic rather than realistic. Great leaders teach reality in two important senses. First, they warn of dangers in a manner that does not offer false hope, but instead clarifies the challenges ahead. They use realistic assumptions and projections to define accurately the magnitude of the challenge. And second, the choices they outline are grounded in reality, so that the discussion of options can produce an informed decision. The reality great leaders teach often includes describing moral considerations that should guide those choices. In this sense, great leaders view their role not as assuming responsibility for solving a problem, but rather of educating those who will be affected. They use troubling times as teaching moments. Few leaders have taught reality as clearly and eloquently 
as Winston Churchill repeatedly did during the first half of the 20th century. He urgently warned of the rising challenge posed by the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. When he ultimately became prime minister on May 10th of 1940, during the difficult early months of the Second World War, he made the British people no promises, for he knew he had none to make. Instead, he offered those who he sought to rally to the cause he championed the strongest possible dose of reality. Addressing the British House of Commons, he declared, I would say to the House, as I say to those who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. No American leader has taught reality with attention to the moral consequences of our national life more clearly than did Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address, delivered on March 4, 1865, a little over a month before the tragic events at Ford's Theater. Lincoln's speech is as notable for what it does not say as for what it does. Consistent with his lifelong practice, Lincoln did not draw attention to himself or what had been accomplished under his stewardship in office. He did not claim credit for the success of the Union troops. Despite encouraging predictions by others, he did not forecast a time when the conflict might finally end, nor that the Confederacy would be defeated. Unlike many political figures, he made no claim nor raised expectations. He simply said, with high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. Instead, he dwelt on three unifying themes. The first was to clarify blame for the conflict. He asserted, all dreaded it, all sought to avert it. Both parties deprecated war but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. He did not accuse. He did not assert superiority. He did not pass judgment. His second theme was to acknowledge the hand of God in men's affairs and in the events that had lasted far longer and with far greater loss of life and treasure than any on either side had anticipated. In his 703-word address, he mentioned God 14 times, quoted the Bible four times, and invoked prayer on three occasions. The Almighty has his own purposes. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the province of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly we do hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash be paid by another drawn with a sword, as was said, 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Lincoln then advanced a third and concluding theme. We must turn our eyes forward, filled not with judgment, not with a desire for revenge, but rather with concern and charity for all, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, 
to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan and to do all we may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Where did Lincoln get his wisdom and his leadership? Abraham Lincoln's mother died when he was nine years of age, and he and his father never established a close or warm relationship. Indeed, the relationship was so distance, distant and sometimes hostile that Thomas Lincoln did not attend Abraham's wedding, never met any of his children, nor did Abraham Lincoln attend his father's funeral. Abraham Lincoln's early life was marked by poverty and severely limited opportunity and was filled with little in the way of inspiring role models. Yet these circumstances did not cause him to lower his sights or simply to embrace the culture around him. In a society of hunters, Lincoln did not hunt. Where many males shot rifles, Lincoln did not shoot. Among many who were cruel to animals, Lincoln was kind. In a world in which men smoked and chewed, Lincoln never used tobacco. In a rough, profane world, Lincoln did not swear. In a social world in which fighting was a regular male activity, Lincoln became a peacemaker. In a hard-drinking society, Lincoln did not drink. In an environment soaked with hostility to Indians, Lincoln resisted it. In a southern flavored setting soft on slavery, Lincoln always opposed it. In a white world with strong racial antipathies, Lincoln was generous to blacks. In an environment indifferent to education, Lincoln cared about it intensely. In a time when gambling was pervasive, Lincoln did not gamble. Physically large and strong, he could have used these attributes for advantage or to draw attention to himself. In the rough and tumble of an often coarse frontier society, distinguished by gambling, drinking, smoking, profanity, violence, and cruelty, his inner compass and his inner strength caused him consistently to choose a different path. This inner strength would inspire others to follow him. Great leaders do not fix problems, but skillfully advance a vision that guides their actions. They focus on a limited number of objectives. They give priority to the long term. They build a foundation of support that sustains the policies they put in place. And they teach reality. Their confident leadership is grounded in their life experience. For great leaders, it is not only about what they do, but who they are. Thank you very much.